All right, everyone, let's go ahead and get this party started. Welcome, class, to Classics 160B1. Meet the Ancients! And today is the lecture where we finish up Archaic Greece and we move into the sources for the project. I, of course, am your professor, Dr. Rob Steffen. And let's go ahead and bring down the lights, bring down the projector, fire it up, and take a look at lecture 5.3, Sources, and how to find them. Now, what we're going to do today, we're going to start with a few announcements. Um, I would guess that 35 minutes out of today, we are going to be talking, uh, finishing up Archaic Greece, okay? And we're going to get to the point, we're not going to quite get to democracy there. I think we'll save that for next Monday. Um, but we'll talk a little bit about Greece. We'll talk a little bit about Athens. We'll talk about Sparta. We'll talk about the conflict that starts brewing between them. And then what we'll do for the last 15 minutes is we're going to talk a little bit about sources for the research proposal. And I'm going to give you some strategies for finding ancient sources about your topic. That tends to be the most difficult thing. Um, usually students are okay at like using Google or using the library's website to find modern secondary sources. It can be really tough to, uh, to find ancient sources. Um, so I'm gonna give you some, some tips and some strategies for doing that. Let's go ahead and see what our announcements are today. What do we have? Ah, same thing as usual. Uh, go ahead and put your screen into speaker view. You can see me, you can see the slides, you can see the words and the images, everything you need to be successful in this class. If you have a question, please direct it to your TA um, and I will try to tackle some of those when we do attendance later in the class. And then finally, and most importantly, keep on your radar that the research proposal is due a week from today. Now, it's still relatively short. We're only talking 250 words. It doesn't have to be Shakespeare or anything like that, all right? Uh, but I want to see some well-thought-out ideas. And part of the idea is that the better you do on this and the more work you put into this, the better the whole project throughout the semester is going to be. So any extra work you put in right now, that is going to pay off in spades as we move forward. All right, so let's go ahead and recap some of the developments of Archaic Greece that we were talking about on Monday and Wednesday, right? Again, we've been through this, these two slides a couple of times. When we hear the word archaic, we tend to think of like cave people fighting woolly mammoths. That is not the deal with Archaic Greece, right? When we talk about Archaic Greece, this is starting around 800 BC, and this is when Greece is really starting to take off. When almost all the different things that we associate with ancient Greece starts to become an actual thing. When we think of stone temples, and we think of cool Greek pottery, and we think of Greek democracy, and we think of Greek philosophy, all of this is starting during the Archaic period. Okay, uh, so let's go ahead and talk about what some of those things are. First and foremost, we're getting increases in population, and what that's leading to is Greeks moving out from their homeland here, right, on the Greek mainland, the west coast of modern-day Turkey, the islands including Crete, and then spreading throughout the Mediterranean, right? So southern Italy and Sicily, southern France, eastern Spain, uh, the Black Sea coast there, right? All these places end up with Greek colonies. And throughout these Greek colonies, we're getting the spread of Greek culture. One of the main parts of that culture is something like sports, and we get the advent of the Olympics in 776 BCE. And that's one of the important things because it's bringing city-states from far and wide across the Mediterranean together to a single place, right? Remember, they're independently governed, and so it's things like the Olympics that actually bring them together into a, a cohesive whole we start to get actual temples, right? And what we're looking at here is a model of the temple from the 8th century. We'll see how that progresses later in today's class. And we get the advent once again, right? The, the Renaissance or rebirth of iconography and pottery. And so when we're looking at what we see in the Bronze Age over here, right, on the far side down there, we're getting iconography with like cool octopuses and dolphins and things like that on their pottery. 
During the Dark Ages, all that iconography disappears, and we end up getting simple geometric shapes. And then during the Archaic period, right, starting in the 8th century, that rebirth of iconography on pottery. And we can kind of see it actually mixing and matching and meshing with the geometric shapes of the Dark Ages, but now introducing geometric stylized um, uh, people as well. So good question in the chat here. Um, are Archaic Greece and the 8th century Renaissance the same thing? Kind of, sort of, kind of, sort of. Okay, so the starting point is the same, okay? So the 8th century is the first century of archaic, of archaic Greece, if that makes sense. So if you're writing down dates, you'd write Archaic Greece 800 to say 480, right? 800 to 480. And then the 8th century Renaissance is just like the first 100 years of that, where things are really kind of blossoming. Okay, and then perhaps most importantly of all, right, we get the advent of writing once again. But this time writing is totally different. So instead of just administrative records, we now get stories. We get the epic poems of Homer, the Iliad, and the Odyssey. We get Hesiod's Theogony, which is the story of the origin of the gods. We get the very first piece of kind of new Greek alphabetic writing ever on this little cup, Nestor's cup here, which is an allusion to one of the things in the Iliad. And this all works because with the alphabet, with the consonants and the vowels, you can make almost any sound that people can make. And so it's really conducive to writing down not just administrative records, but what people are actually saying. Okay, so those are some of the major developments right at the beginning of the Archaic period. And then what we saw is that one of the major themes throughout this period in Greece, and one of the reasons we study it, one of the reasons this is unique, is because we get this move towards equality, all right? If we look back at the Bronze Age, we see the, the political power centralized in a single person, one of these great kings. And as we move through the Dark Ages and into the Archaic, it's slowly spreading out, slowly spreading out to a larger group of people. Um, okay, so, right, what we see in the Bronze Age, we see the Wanakes, the Great Kings, the Dark Ages, we get these weaker, smaller kings by the Archaic. In many places, we're getting oligarchy, or the rule of a small group of aristocratic elites. And one of the things that we talked about last time, right, was why this is occurring, right? Why does Greece move towards equality when the norm, when you're looking at Egypt or you're looking at the Near East, is to get greater and greater power centralized in, a, in a, a single person. And we came up with three reasons, right? We talked about three reasons. One, we get a more even distribution of wealth, right? So the richest people in Greece are pretty poor compared to like the richest people when you look at the Persian Empire. We also saw that there was a brand new style of warfare and these Greek city-states are like constantly at war, right? Frequently between themselves. But this new style of warfare, right? What we call phalanx warfare, the way it's set up, it promotes equality. Remember, you're there, you're guarding half of yourself and half of the person next to you. And the whole formation, the whole strategy only works if everybody is working together equally. And so that's one of the big things that's pushing people towards equality as well. And then finally, when we looked at this, right, we looked at ideology and we saw that one of the things that's very different in Greece than in other places at this time is that the political elite don't control religion. There are still priesthoods, right? There's not a complete separation of church and state, but it's not quite the same thing that we're getting as in other parts of the world where in order to have any connection to the gods, you have to go through that priesthood. In Greece, right, no matter who you are, no matter how low you are, right, you can make a sacrifice and connect with the gods. So those three things, right, the distribution of wealth or the more even distribution of wealth, the new style of phalanx warfare, and this new ideology that allows anyone to connect to the gods, those are three of the main reasons that we're getting this push towards equality in ancient Greece. All right, so 
let's go ahead and recap some of the cultural developments we talked about last time, and we'll introduce a few new ones as well. So first of all, we talked about a philosophical movement, right? We're not to Socrates and Plato and Aristotle yet. We'll get to them, not next week, but week after next week. But we are in this period called the Ionian Enlightenment, all right? And this is hugely important because people start asking questions about not just like how things happen, but why they happen, right? And they're trying to come up with explanations that don't necessarily stem from the gods, right? They're no longer satisfied with the explanation that it's Zeus that's hurling lightning bolts. Now, they don't totally get it right, right? Somebody comes up with the idea that everything in the world is made up of water, right? Different forms of it, solid like ice, uh, liquid water, um, gases like steam. But they're starting to come up with these theories, right? That would apply in different realms of the world and explain lots of different phenomena, right? That's what we call this kind of like knowledge across different systems. So people are starting to think of the world in a way that doesn't necessarily rely completely on the gods. We get really important uh, developments when it comes to Greek artistic sculptures, right? And we see this happens very shortly after Greeks, Greece sets up its very first colony in Egypt. And after that, we get this archaic statuary, which you're looking at here, which is modeled almost completely on ancient Egyptian statuary, right? You get the same sort of thing. It's a it's a like a, a tall, a strong, idealized, front-facing person, right? We've got one foot out in front. Usually it's the left foot out in front. Um, with the Greek ones in the archaic period, you also get something known as the archaic smile, right? Just the hint of a little smile on all the different people. Um, and these kind of almond-shaped eyes. You can tell from the body that uh, everything's kind of muscular and idealized. And what you start getting very, very slowly, right, as we're moving this direction, is things become a little less geometric and a little less stylized and a little bit more lifelike and a little bit more fluid, right? It's almost like they're becoming less rigid as you go this direction. And what we're gonna see is in the classical period, you start getting a lot of movement, and by the Hellenistic period, that's coming a little bit later in the course, movement is going everywhere. Hellenistic sculpture, it's awesome. Really, really cool stuff. So we'll get to that later on, but we see the birth of that in the Archaic period. We start to get stone temples, right? Uh, so we saw that this was at the very beginning of the Archaic period. Over time, it's kind of next iteration are large wooden temples. I don't have a picture of those because the wooden temples don't exist anymore because the wood melted or rotted or whatever wood does. Um, but the iteration after that is that those wood temples turn into stone, right? They start building out of stone. And we do have those towards the later part of the Archaic period. So this is at the site of Pestum in southern Italy. And remember that that's a, a hugely Greek area during this time. And one of the things we talked about, right, were the different types of temples. So hopefully you've gotten your notes, little sketches here, uh, and you've got the three orders of Greek architecture. We've got Doric, Ionic, and Corinthian. And remember, as an art historian, right, if you're wandering around ancient Rome or Greece or southern Italy or wherever, and you want to be able to tell your family or your friends or your girlfriend or your boyfriend what style and what order of architecture this is, the main place you want to look is at the very top, look at the capitals, right? So the Doric one is the kind of simple bowl-shaped capital. The Ionic one is the scroll kind of capital, right? We call those scrolls volutes. And then the flowery one, the flowery one is the Corinthian capital. That's the most recent one, all right? So Doric, Ionic, and Corinthian. And we also started looking at the plan for what a temple actually consisted of, right? So the columns around the outside, we call that the peristyle. We've got the little entryway or the pronous, right? Literally the area in front of the nous. And the nous itself is the sanctuary. This is very literally the house or the home of the god. And there's a cult statue in, in there. And that's where the cult statue lives, basically, okay? 
And so that cult statue then is treated in large part like a living thing, right? It's clothed, it's fed, right? That's part of what the sacrifices are. It's cleaned and taken care of. And then in this back area, uh, this is known in, in um, Greek as the uh, apisthodomos, okay? And in English, we would translate as that as like the, the treasury. So when people bring gifts for the gods, right? You can only have like so many bronze tripods or limestone statues or whatever people are leaving for the gods. They'll get piled up in the little treasury in the back here. Okay, now one of the things that you end up seeing is that these temples, right? They are for the worship of the gods, for sure. But city-states throughout the Greek world start to use these temples as a way to compete with one another, right? They're like competing for prestige against other city-states by showing how many awesome temples they can build. And this especially happens in Sicily. Sicily is huge, hugely prevalent with Greek city-states um, and uh, they're, they, they become fabulously wealthy because Sicily is so good for growing grain, right? They can basically get rich off of grain and they use that money to build a bunch of temples. So this is the ancient site of Akragas, modern Agrigento on the, the south side of uh, the island of Sicily. And you can see it, right? There's a huge temple up here, another temple here, the remains of another temple over here, the remains of another temple down here, right? They called this the Valley of the Temples at Agrigento. Also in Sicily, we can see the ancient site of Silenus, modern Selenunte. This is a little bit west of Agrigento. And these, they're just lined up right next to each other. Now, what you're looking at here, right, they're in various stages of uh, preservation. So this one's preserved pretty well, or it's been reconstructed. This one, not as much. This one, huge temple down here. What they've done is they've kind of like bulldozed all the like remnants of the column drums and just put it back on the base of the temple, but they haven't reconstructed it. But if you ever go to these sites and you ever walk around, right, this is three out of like nine massive temples at the site of Silenus. And then we can look in southern Italy as well, right? Just, just across the Straits of Messina. If you go to Pestum, um, first of all, almost nobody goes to Pestum. And we need to talk about when you guys go to Italy, right? You obviously have to go to Pompeii because you're doing this course, so you have to go down to Pompeii. We'll talk about that in the second half of the course. But very few people continue going south and get to this site of Pestum, which was ancient Poseidonia, right? Literally the city of Poseidon. And when you get there, right? First of all, it's awesome because like nobody's at the site. You get to walk around and see all these temples with like five other people there and it's incredible. Uh, second of all, they're super well preserved. So we've got one down here. This is a temple to Athena way down at the end. And then we've got two really large ones here and people argue about what these are. Uh, whether it's a temple to Hera, some people say that, other people argue that they're actually both temples to Poseidon. This one's archaic, this one's classical. Um, but you can see the city-state, right, kind of investing lots of money in these very large-scale temples, which take a lot of resources to build, as a way to compete with other city-states. Last travel, last travel tip for when you go to Pestum. One of the, the super cool things that this area is known for is the production of uh, buffalo mozzarella. So they have water buffalo down here and the mozzarella cheese that's produced from the buff, uh, buffalo mozzarella or from the buffalo uh, has like, it's like a higher fat content and uh, it's just super creamy. It's known right, throughout the world as like the best type of mozzarella. And so you can actually stay on one of these like buffalo farms and they'll like take you through and show you how the mozzarella is made and let you go see the buffalo. And they're a little like baby buffalo. And it's a fantastically amazing experience. And you can go eat like buffalo like sausage and buffalo mozzarella and buffalo mo like milk ice cream and absolutely fantastic experience. Go to Pestum, it's super cool. Okay, so one of the things we haven't talked about is uh, the kind of start of Greek pottery. And this is where we left off in the eighth century, right? 
Remember that it's taking the geometric shapes of the Dark Ages, but they're getting much more complex and people are getting added onto them. And what we're moving towards now, right, as we get into the archaic, is they're moving away from these geometric shapes towards more kind of depiction of people and animals. And this starts near the site of Corinth, okay? And what Corinth is doing is it's drawing on iconography from the ancient Near East, right? Remember how the Greeks kind of like stole slash borrowed the alphabet from the Phoenicians? They're doing something similar here with the way that they depict uh, animals and people. So what we see here, this is called Proto-Corinthian. We can see an emphasis on this kind of uh, like lion, leonid um, animal depiction here. And as we move forward with actual Corinthian, right? So this is kind of the earlier version. And now we have this full-fledged version of Corinthian pottery with red and black on white here. And we get these like animals and lions that are very, very similar to what you get in the ancient Near East. So this is from the site of Babylon. This one down here is from Persepolis, the home of the ancient Persian empire. This one is Susa. I don't know. I don't know exactly where that one comes from, um, but maybe it's a, maybe it's Nineveh. I'm going to go with Nineveh. All right. Anyway, the important thing here is that early on, what's going on in the archaic is people are stealing the way that they depict animals and what they're depicting from the ancient Near East. But as we tend to move forward, the Greeks kind of start to develop their, their own unique thing. Right. So in Athens, in the 6th century, the 500s BC, they start a totally new type of pottery that not so creatively we call black figure pottery, right? Because the figures are in black, right? And that's going to contrast with red figure when the figures are in red. But this is your uh, art history lesson for today. And you can use this whenever you go to a museum that has Greek pottery, at least. All right, whenever you're seeing pottery that looks like this, where the figures are in black and the backgrounds in orange or red, you can feel pretty confident that that's from the 6th century BC, the 500s BC. So if you see something like this, you can go, hmm, yes, archaic pottery indeed, right? That must be attic black figure. I'd, I'd wager a guess it's 6th century. And you're almost always going to be right. You're going to sound super smart. And that contrasts with the next development, which is where they flipped this. And we get what we not so creatively call Athenian red figure, where the people are in the orange or red, and then the background is in black. And when you see something like that, you can frequently be like, mm, indeed, Attic red figure, I would wager 5th century BC. And you're almost always going to be correct. <laughs> um, and you're going to sound super smart when you go to the museum. So, uh, again, you don't need to remember exactly what's on each of these, but know that if, like, the figures are in black, you're talking the 6th century or the 500s. And if the figures are in red, right, you're talking about the 5th century or the 400s. So a quick and easy way to uh, differentiate Greek pottery. But also, what we see over the course of this evolution, right, is the, the kind of evolution from the Greeks drawing upon other influences in their styles to really coming up with something that's very uniquely their own. And here you can see this kind of all put together here. There we go. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about um, Athens and Sparta. Because the evolution of each of these city-states is going to be crucial for the overall big picture of Greek history. Uh, because their conflict is going to lead to something that we eventually call democracy, which is kind of a big deal. And also, this eventually leads them into conflict with the larger world. Right? We're going to be moving out of Greece and we're going to be coming into contact with other parts of the Mediterranean. So remember that when we're looking at ancient Greece, many of these city-states have oligarchies, but some of them also have different forms of govern government, right? Monarchy, tyrannies, democracies, that sort of thing. Um, and Sparta is a good example of one that doesn't really have an oligarchy. 
So first things first, when we're identifying Sparta, we're looking in the region known as the Peloponnese, all right? And this is named after Pelops, who was actually diced up and fed to the gods, unfortunately, um, by his dad. His dad was like not a very nice guy. Uh, but anyway, the whole like peninsula here, this whole area is known as the Peloponnese. And Sparta is down here kind of in the southeast in the region of Laconia. All right. And to give you a, um, a kind of sense of geographical relationships here, Athens is up here. This is the, the, the peninsula of Attica and Athens is right around here. So they're not particularly close to one another. Now, Sparta, according to the archaeological record, is founded in the Dark Ages, around 1000 BCE. And one of the hypotheses that's been put forth is that when we get Sparta, what we're getting is we're getting a melding of two different smaller settlements. Okay? And the reason we think that is because the form of government that emerges in Sparta is a dual monarchy. I don't know. They should have a portmanteau. A dual larky. <laughs> I don't know. Um, a dual monarchy, right? Two kings ruling at the same time. And so we think it's maybe two villages that merge together, and each one of those put forward a uh, political ruler. Now, in the early days of Sparta, if you remember one single person, you want to remember this guy, this guy by the name of Lycurgus, right? Uh, and Lycurgus is this famous kind of early political leader and lawgiver. And many of the attributes that we associate with ancient Sparta are traditionally kind of attributed to his invention. So one of the things, right, is this um, homeoi, is the, uh, the idea that all men in the city have equal, equal status, right? They get equal amounts of land, they divide it up equally, they give it to the citizens, the citizens are all equal. And then they're ruled uh, by a couple different groups. So they have the Gerousia, the Council of Elders, and that kind of balances out the dual monarchy, right? So there's a series of checks and balances from an early period. Famously, the currency in Sparta are these Pelinors. And this is an iron currency because they thought gold and silver made men greedy and made men weak and soft, right? So they are Spartans. They are gonna use iron as their currency. And you can just imagine, right, an Athenian walking up with like three silver coins and a Spartan like lugging a sack of iron over his shoulder uh, to pay for a goat or something like that. Uh, and then they break down the citizenry into different groups. So the Sicitia are these groups of adult men, 15 each, and they all kind of contribute to the, the food to the group. They eat together. Um, they do almost everything together. And the idea is it builds these social bonds that are nearly unbreakable. And then finally, you may have heard of this before, is the agoge. And the agoge, this is what the children, the, the boys are put into is starting at age seven, where they go out into the wilderness and they have to survive on their own and they have to find food for themselves. Um, and, you know, if they're, they're kind of come up short, they're whipped. Uh, and it's the beginning of this kind of severe Spartan training that's going to make them the best warriors in the world. Now, from an early period, right, from the Archaic period, Sparta, down here, starts expanding. And they start doing so by taking over first this area here, Messenia, and then going into other parts of the Peloponnese as well. And in defeating Messini, they end up basically making a huge part of the population there, turning them into slaves. But it's not the same kind of, they're, these, they're called helots, they're these state-owned slaves, but they do a bunch uh, of the agricultural labor so that the men, the citizen men in Sparta, focus on things like military training, that sort of thing. And eventually, over the Archaic period, Sparta is able to band together a bunch of different regions of the Peloponnese and form what we call the Peloponnesian League. And that's going to become important, that Peloponnesian League is what's going to go up against Athens later on. Okay, now, in Athens, what's going on? Athens goes way back before Sparta. It was like 
found it in the Neolithic. It was a thing in the Bronze Age. It wasn't a big deal in the Bronze Age, but it existed. And again, just to give you a big picture, right, it's on this little peninsula known as Attica here, the big red star. Sparta's down here in the Peloponnese. Those are the two that we're talking about. Okay, but in the Archaic period, Athens got problems, right? And their problems have to do uh, with this idea or concept of debt bondage. And what this is, is that when people get into debt with somebody else, right, they borrow money and they don't pay it back immediately, they have to go work for that person for free until they can pay back their loan. But they can't pay back their loan because they're not making any money because they're working for this other person for free. And so this happens on quite a large scale and it really becomes a big problem. So in the seventh century, in 632, there's a huge revolt. It's led by this guy, Cylon. And so he's basically getting a bunch of people together saying like, we need to get rid of this like debt bondage thing. And the people in control, a family known as the Alcmyonids. Athens is an oligarchy at this time, right? A small group of people ruling at the top. They come down so hard on this revolt that Cylon and his followers, they take refuge in the temple of Athena. And the Alcmyonids, they drag them out of the temple and they massacre them all. And one of the crazy things is that we think we may have like the actual remains of some of this because we found, we found people like in bonds having been massacred essentially. Um, but this is so bad that the rest of the Athenians like kick out the leaders. They're like, that was, you cannot go drag people out of the temple of Athena and kill them. Like that is a sanctuary, right? That is a sacred place. Uh, and so they ban the Alcmaeonids. They kick them out of the city of Athens and they curse the family saying you're never allowed back. And this is kind of a weird story, but it's going to come into play on Monday, this curse of the Alcmaeonids when we get the origins of democracy. So anyway. Keep that in mind, they're coming back. So the next guy to try to deal with this issue of debt bondage, a guy you may have heard of, at least in form, is this guy Draco. And Draco uh, basically says that the way that we're gonna deal with this is we're gonna make unbelievably harsh laws. So the punishment for everything is death. You steal from your neighbor, you're dead, right? You graffiti the temple, you're dead. You do whatever, you're dead. This is a terrible system of laws, right? <laughs> this does not work either, but that's where we get our term, right? If you've ever heard the term like, oh man, that was a pretty draconian punishment. It goes back to this guy Draco uh, during the archaic period in Athens. Next up, we get this guy called Solon. And Solon is our almost democracy guy. Right? So starting right after 600, right, in 594, he's the guy who really takes care of the debt bondage issue. So he says, he comes up with this rule that everybody owns their own bodies, debt bondage is no longer a thing, he starts redistributing land, he bans the export of grain so that everybody in the city can eat, he's canceling everybody's debts, and then he even changes the form of government. So he's the first guy to build an assembly where people can vote. And then the Areopagus, which is kind of the judicial branch. And then this Council of 400, um, which uh, focuses on setting the agenda that people vote on. Now, it doesn't last. So if I ask a question, right, like, who's the guy responsible for Athenian democracy as we know it? It's not Solon, right? He tries, but it, it doesn't last. Um, but he's got the right kind of idea. And, it, and what we get in the end is, is going to be somewhat similar to this. Instead, what happens is we get this tyrant. He kicks Solon out, and we get this guy, Pisistratus. All right? Now, Pisistratus is a tyrant. He's taken power. He's the sole leader. This is the definition of a tyrant, right? A single person who seized power for himself or herself. And people kind of like the guy. Like, Athens is doing really well during the 500s, during the 6th century, with him in, like, in charge. And so, you know, he, he's not that bad. He gets kicked out sometimes, but he always finds his way back in there. And eventually when he dies, his two sons, by the name of Hippias and Hipparchus, take over. So they're kind of like dual tyrants. And they're going to be the, the last of the tyrants here. And this is where we get uh, the story of the fall of, 
of the tyrants, uh, what we call the tyrannicides, right, or the tyrant slayers. And this is a statue of these guys. So this is um, Harmodius here, the younger guy, no beard, and Aristogeiton, the older guy with a beard. And the way that this actually plays out is a little weird. It's not that they had some really, it's not based on a political objection to tyrants, but rather Hippias is it? No, it's Hipparchus is in love with Harmodius, right? You don't need to remember the exact names here. Maybe remember Harmodius and Aristogeiton as the Tyrannicides. But one of the tyrants is in love with the younger guy. But he rebuffs him and says, no, no, no. I'm with this other guy here. I'm with Aristogeiton already. And as a result, the tyrants ban their sister. They ban his sister from the Panathenaic Games. And we haven't talked about what those are yet, but they're a big deal and banning their sister from it is not a cool thing to do. And as a result, these guys get together and say, no more tyrants, the tyrants must die. And so they have this assassination attempt. They only get one of them, they only get Hipparchus. Hippias is like still around. Uh, and um, uh, Harmodius, one of the, the two guys is killed immediately, the other guy's tortured to death. And in the aftermath, they become like legendary heroes in Athens after the switch to democracy. So we're going to talk about the switch to democracy, right? How that leads to democracy. We're going to talk about that on Monday. What I'd like you guys to do now is go ahead and do the attendance for this week. Uh, so today's answer is green. I'll try to answer a few of the questions and then we'll spend the last 10 minutes or so on sources and how to find them. Okay, so research proposal for groups. You guys have got the spreadsheet on D2L. Go there, put all the members of your group and bold the name of the person who submitted it. You don't all have to submit it. One person can submit it and just bold that person so that we know who's responsible for that. And if something's missing, we, um, well, we can differentiate a missing assignment from somebody who's submitted as part of a group, but like it wasn't their role to do the submission. How hard is it to find pots and re-piece them together? I, it totally depends on the context in which they're found. And so if they're found as part of like a tomb, frequently they're pretty doable to piece them back together. Like in large part, as part of a tomb, you get them, they're broken, but usually a lot of it's still there. If you get them, like one of the things that archeologists love are trash dumps. Trash dumps are like the best for archeologists because you can see the different layers, right? And you can see things change over time. If things are thrown into a trash dump and mixed around, then it's, you're, you're much more likely dealing with small fragments of things. Why do the roofs fall apart before the walls and columns? Uh, in large part, um, the answer is that the, the columns would have fallen apart too. And when you go see like a temple like the Parthenon, frequently, is that the columns are, are re-put together. The drums are re-stacked on one another. But the, they, they do stand up better and sometimes you still get them in place. But the reason for that is those are all made out of stone, whereas the roof frequently been, would have been made out of wood uh, and then tile would have been put on top of that, okay? So it's a, it's a difference in construction materials there. If you're working alone, do you have to tell your TA? Nope. Can you explain the last slide again? I'll, I'll explain the last slide. Like we'll, we'll cover this like uh, coup at the end of, um, or at the beginning of class on, uh, on Monday again. But the basic idea is that there's a lover's quarrel, right? You get these two guys, Harmodius and Aristogeiton, and they're having problems with these two other guys, uh, Hippias and Hipparchus, who are the tyrants. And a result of this is that the sister of this guy gets banned from the Panathenaic Games, which is like a big religious set of games. It's a big deal. And um, as a result, they try to kill the tyrants. But they're only mildly successful, and then both of them die. But again, we'll cover it in more depth on, uh, on Monday. Any estimation of population of Athens and Sparta during the Archaic period? There is, but I don't know it off the top of my head. I'll have to, to look that up, and that's a good one for Monday as well. 
Uh, should there be a specific topic for the, the research project? The topic is very much up to you. I would like at least part of it to relate to the Greco-Roman world. So you can do something comparative. If you want to study Norse, you know, antiquity or uh, East Asian antiquity or something like that, cool. Pick a topic within that, but then do a, something comparative with the Greco-Roman world as well. How would you even come up with an estimation for population? That's a great question. So one is like, we actually can get a, a, a pretty good sense for the size of a city, right? So it's actually easier to do in an urban area than it is for the rural countryside. Um, but uh, that's, that's one way to do it, is basically calculate the area, calculate the number of houses, get an estimation for the people living in each house, and then multiply it out. That's one way you do it. What program uh, is the Honors Project using? It's called Engage VR. Um, so Engage is the name of the program, and we'll talk more about that uh, next week. Okay, so we've got eight minutes left. Let's talk about sources. What's the difference between a primary and secondary source? Can somebody blow me up in the chat here and, uh, and explain the difference between these two? Ancient versus interpretation. Diary letters or witnesses for primary source. Primary is original. Yeah, these are all along the, the right lines here, right? The, the main idea is when we're looking at a primary source, like a true primary source is anything that was created by somebody who experienced whatever it is it's about, okay? So like, if you are taking notes, from this lecture. Your notes are a primary source about this lecture. If you go talk to your friends at lunch after this and you tell them about how awesome this lecture was on Archaic Greece, and then they write some notes down, then they've got a secondary source about the lecture, right? They weren't actually here, but they used information to kind of summarize it or something like that. So that's the big difference, right? A primary source is as something that's created by somebody who experienced the event, whereas a secondary source is something that's created by somebody who wasn't there. Uh, and what that means is primary sources can be a lot of different things, right? Well, we don't have much audio from the ancient world, but for the modern world, that could be the part. Um, uh, images, objects, right? Artifacts could be primary sources uh, for the ancient world. Uh, statistics, texts, historical documents, literature, that sort of thing. Um, okay, so I want to ask you guys a couple questions here. What we're looking at here is known as a source book. And what a source book is, is a collection of ancient sources, right, about a theme. So this one's about gods, heroes, and monsters. And what it is, is a collection of ancient sources, in translation, about that theme, right? So here's a couple excerpts from Hesiod in this book. So what do you guys think? You think that's uh, primary or secondary? I will... What do you guys think? It's pretty even here. All right, we got about 60-40 here. About 60-40 primary, secondary, right? I'm gonna do a couple of these and then we'll, we'll talk through them. Uh, what about Homer's Iliad? Oh, we got a couple others here. This is good. Can I get at least one person who says primary to explain in the chat what their view is? One person who says secondary to do the same and one person who said other to give their logic. Yeah, 
this is really good, right? So like um, part of the, the idea here is that uh, in some ways, if you're asking, it depends on what question you're asking, right? I didn't ask a particularly pointed question. If you're asking, is this a primary or secondary source for the Trojan War, you would have to say secondary, right? Homer wasn't actually at the Trojan War. He wasn't there being like, oh man, Achilles got another one. But if the question is, is this a primary or secondary source for what Greeks in the eighth century thought about the Trojan War, then absolutely it's a primary source. And if we look back, right, if we look back at the source book, you can apply a similar sort of logic, right? So in some ways, right, this is a secondary source about the actual origin of the gods, but it's a primary source for what the Greeks thought about the origin of the gods. And then it's kind of a secondary source because it's a modern person cobbling together different excerpts and they, they you know, they choose those. Um, but it's a, a primary source in the sense that, like, these are the ancient texts, you know, even though they've, they've been translated. So for this project, right, I want you to kind of be cognizant of those differences when we're actually going through, and, and TAs, you can kind of keep this in mind, when we're going through and we're looking to see what sources you've got, I'm happy to count for th this, these purposes, anything ancient will count as your primary sources, okay? So don't worry too much about it. I want you to understand the difference. And I want you to know that like Homer probably wasn't there at the Trojan War recording it, but that would count as one of your primary or ancient sources. Okay, now we can talk more about this next week. But in terms of three ways to do this, right, we'll, we'll go through it really quick now and then we'll, we'll finish up with it next week. Um, there are three strategies for finding these. The first is just Googling it. Google what you're interested in and then add primary source or ancient author to the end. So an example might be if I'm doing my project on Roman warfare, just look at Roman warfare, primary source, the first link you go to, it gives you a bunch of different people from the ancient world who wrote about warfare. And you can click on them to find more information. So you got Caesar and Polybius um, uh, and Cassius Dio there. So that's option number one. Option number two are source books. And that's like what I showed you earlier on. These are gonna be hugely helpful for you if you can find one tailored to your topic. So I'm gonna post a better picture of this. You can't actually read this right now, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to find where my original scans of what this are. This is a whole series of these things based on different aspects of culture, right? So they have one on like uh, gender in the Roman world. They have one on religion in the Roman world. They have one on the economy of the Roman world. Um, and what those are, they're gonna be a general topic or theme, and then it's a whole collection of ancient sources within that. So that's gonna be really useful for you guys moving forward. Finally, and again, I'll, I'll look those up and I'll, I'll, I'll try to get those sources up there this weekend. And finally, use secondary sources. If you can't find anything, start with a secondary source, right? So here I'm looking up ancient Roman engineering. I found a secondary source, the Oxford Handbook to Engineering in the Classical World. Then go find yourself a chapter that looks promising. So here we are, hydraulic engineering and water supply. Secondary source for sure. And just start reading it and look for when you find the ancient sources, right? It's usually not on page one, but this is like, what? By page six, we've got like three primary sources. You can find them by looking for the people with the weird names, right? We've got Pliny up here. We've got uh, Vitruvius down here. Um, and then you work backwards to find out what it is that they actually read. So you go into the bibliography and you can find the name of the ancient source that that's drawn from. So we can practice that a little bit. Uh, next week, but again, the three ideas, Google it, Roman Warfare, Primary Source, look for a source book, that's a whole collection of them, or start with the secondary sources and work backwards. That's so, I have a very quick note on a question that a student asked me. About of course. It seems like some students are interested in including images in their proposal, and what I told them is that you usually include those as figures, you know, following the formatting rules. Um, so just so you know, it might be good to also touch on that a little bit on Monday, maybe when we continue talking about this, because some of them want to know if they need to include the photos as pictures, or if they 
citations. Yeah, that's a that's a great point. And and what I would like you guys to do is, it, you know, including those isn't going to cut down on the word limit at all. You still have to meet the actual word limit. Um, but you know, a an artifact or a picture of an artifact can absolutely serve as a source. All right. Uh, what I would like to make sure of is that everybody has at least one written ancient source, right? So at least one of your sources has to be a text. If, based on your topic, an archaeological artifact or feature or something like that makes sense for you, that's totally fine as your second one, okay? So we'll recap that on, uh, on Monday. Guys, that is it for today. Let's bring up the, uh, the projector and the lights here. Thank you for sticking with me. Have a wonderful, wonderful weekend, and I will see you back here on Monday. All right. Bye, everyone.